Hey, this is Dan and Bodhi Chief, and every Saturday evening beginning 7 p.m. on the Pacific Coast, Universal Life Reverb Radio Broadcasts. What inspires a song? Whether you're old school or new school friends, we're going to highlight musicians from the past and up and coming musicians that are making an impact through their music on their communities and the world around them. Yeah, sometimes it's going to be controversial, friends. Sometimes it's going to be a little bit mellow. But either way, music does make a difference in our lives, and that's what this show is about. Universal Life Reverb Radio. Broadcast every Saturday evening, 7 p.m. on the California coast, 10 p.m. on the eastern seaboard. I'll be your host every week, Daniel Bodie Chapin. We want to encourage you to tune in, whether you're young or old, or somewhere caught in between. There's a lot going on in the world today, but music does make a difference. And we're going to highlight that on Universal Life Reverb Radio every Saturday evening at 7 p.m. through Blog Talk Radio. Life Reverb Radio. I'm your host, Daniel Bodie Chapin. Friends, you've made it through another week. It's Saturday evening, 7 p.m. on the Pacific Coast, 10 p.m. on the Eastern Seaboard. Wherever you have tuned in across the world, we're so thankful that you've joined us. Get settled in. We've got a special broadcast that we're blessed and excited about, including our highlight for the evening, Miss Jennifer Knapp. You're listening to Refine Me here on Universal Life Reverb Radio, where we focus on musicians and artists that are making a difference in their communities. Thanks for tuning in. On another continent, some 9,000 miles from the United States, in a corner of the earth where there's no internet, no electricity, no telephone, from wherever you might stand, you might see red dirt, sky, well-adapted wildlife, rock piles next to dirt roads that seem to go on and on forever. Desolate, but not empty. You might have passed this young lady who you're listening to, who's highlighting our show this evening, Jennifer Knapp, along the way. A Grammy-nominated, Dove Award-winning artist who was happy to let go of all the success she had, to live a very different kind of life, looking to reclaim a part of herself she felt she lost in all the excitement of her accomplishments. She'll be joining us on Universal Life Reverb along with a great lineup. Thanks for tuning in. Jennifer's first three albums were all critical and commercial successes. She won her first Dove Award in 1999 for Best New Artist, scoring two Grammy nods and another Dove nomination in 2003. She was touted by People Magazine as an uncommonly literate songwriter, and she'll be joining us for a conversation. It's interesting that this young lady at the top of her game just let go. Along with Jennifer, the lineup that we're excited about includes also Zarina Lupo from New York, Nikki Kelly from Los Angeles, and Carly Joe Jackson.
Thank you once again for joining us here on Universal Life Reverb Radio through Blog Talk Radio. I'm your host, Daniel Bodie Chapin. You know, we know that you could be joining us from anywhere in the world. You've made it through another week. You've just heard the song. The song was Refine Me by Miss Jennifer Knapp, and she's highlighting our broadcast. We're going to have a conversation with Jennifer, who I believe is calling in now. And uh, we're just really excited about that. We're here every Saturday evening, 7 p.m. here on the Pacific Coast, 10 p.m. on the Eastern Seaboard. And as always, I'm your host, Daniel Bodie Chapin. Let me tell you the, a little bit before we bring Jennifer on the air, uh, and we gave a little bit of an introduction, as you heard, about Jennifer's uh, history, her music. And uh, we're going to be kind of doing it unplugged a little bit tonight and just having a conversation with Jennifer and focusing on her music and her message, her faith, and how music impacts her and how her music, as well as the other artists that we have lined up tonight, uh, their music impacts the community. Universal Life Reverb Radio is about that and that alone. It's about focusing on artists and how they're impacting in a positive way uh, the community around them. So thanks for joining us. Let's see if we can get Jennifer on the air. By the way, this is uh, an amazing young lady, and uh, we're excited to have her on the air. Let's see if we can bring her on now. This is Daniel Bodie Chapin. You are on Universal Life Reverb Radio. Who's calling in, please? This is Jennifer. I hope you're talking to me. <laughs> I am absolutely talking to you, Jennifer. Welcome to our show. What would happen if it was somebody else, I wonder? Uh, well, I'd cut them off. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, I good appreciate to be with you. What's that? I said good to be with you. It's good to have you on the air. And you know what, Jennifer, uh, this is an opportunity for us to just talk and have a conversation. And, and uh, I've been in correspondence uh, with you uh, over the last couple of weeks. And so we're real thankful that you're coming on. Universal Life Reverb Radio, uh, Jennifer, is hosted through Blog Talk Radio, uh, which is the largest uh, talk radio network in the United States right now. And uh, we just uh, highlight every week <coughs> artists across the globe, um, up-and-coming artists, artists that are seasoned such as yourself, and uh, where their music comes from and how they're impacting the community. And so uh, we're just real thankful that you've, uh, you've come on. Now, you're calling in from... Nashville, if I'm knowing correctly. Yes, ab uh, absolutely. Today I happen to be back in the, where I live, which is currently in Nashville, Tennessee. Wonderful. Now, you were not born and raised in Nashville. You're actually a Kansas girl, if I understand correct. That's right. Yeah, born and raised in Kansas, and then I've you know I've lived all around really um, throughout the U.S. Um, I think I've lived in Michigan for a while, Tennessee a couple times, and a. Then I've lived overseas as well, so I've, it's been a long time since I've been about a, back at Kansas, but that's definitely kind of my roots. Well, we're going to talk a little, a little bit about that, uh, Jennifer, if you don't mind tonight. You know, I, I, I've told our listeners, uh, and we preempted this show, um, a, a, a lot about, and it's been highlighted over the years, as you know. Uh, you're not an amateur uh, in the industry, uh, in the music industry, um, and what I've kind of let people know is, uh, yeah, you, you, you've, you've been there. You've done that. You've done music, and your music obviously is a making impact. But you began one place, and I think that your faith in who you are as an individual and your music has taken you somewhere else. But let me ask you something, if I can, and let me just preempt this again, reminding our listeners, Jennifer Knapp is on the air this is a young lady that has sold over one million albums uh, uh, initially um, and is continuing to make an impact on the music community. Um, but Jennifer, we have a lot of young people that are listening on the air. And where did music start for you? What is, I mean, you've, you've, been, you've received two Grammy nods. You've received Dove Awards. Again, over a million albums sold. You're very successful. You did something unusual, um, but I think very honorable. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later. But let me ask you something. All of that success, 
where did it all come from? Where does music come from for you? <laughs> Kansas girl, uh, you, you, talk to us a little bit about that. Well, I, you know, I don't, I think success is a funny word. Um, it's, you know, I think at the end of the day, you know, one of the things that, that for me that's, that I realize is that for me at some point in time, music itself has been a part of my life. Um, for for a very long time. I mean, from from my early youth when I, I kind of found, you know, intrigue in, in playing, you know, a plastic recorder or um, starting to kind of pound out notes on the piano. And I don't, I really can't explain to you why I began to um, really be, gravi- you know, why I was really gravitating to music. But for whatever reason, it's been a part of my life as long as I can really remember as a person being able to choose that. Um, and later on, I think as I, you know, as I, as I grew up, I, I definitely started to kind of um, choose that in, um, in, you know, in ways that have actually began to represent me professionally. I went to college as a, as a trumpet major, actually. I was a music education major, and um, that kind of got interrupted by um, the success that I was having as a, a performing artist doing some of my singing and songwriting. And the writing songs about my faith landed me on a Christian record. So, I mean, it's it's kind of a crazy thing because it, in one term I would say, listen, music is just part of my life. Whether anyone's listening, whether I get paid to do the job, um, whether it is a job, it's something that I go to that's, that's very important to me just in my daily life. Um, but when, you know, you throw the word success in there, it becomes a different thing. Obviously, you know, when you rely on that to pay your, your bills and your rent and your income, um, it becomes, it, you know, it's, a, it's kind of a funny, it's a, a double-edged sword that I, I kind of find out, found out. I mean, I, for, at one point in time, many people would have said that I was very successful at my career, but the success wasn't the part of it that was really actually driving me to, to kind of participate. Um, I think, you know, at a time where I just felt like that, that for me, when, after, when I was at this moment of critical success, it was feeling like I, I really began to question whether or not, you know, whether or not I wanted to be successful in music. It was something that was a part of my life and is a way that I told my story um, with other people. But if I was going to tell my story to other people and that was going to create, you know, tragedy and controversy in my life, maybe I didn't want to play with that anymore. So it's it's kind of a, a double-edged sword music because I think in order for me anyway it's it's always required a very large portion of my heart and I've always kind of thrown myself fully into it. But when I throw myself fully into it, it, it definitely kind of tends to play itself out on a public in a very public way. And it's you know it's definitely something you have to kind of think about whether or not you want to do that or not. I get that, and and you, Jennifer, obviously went through a period of time where you really kind of stood back and had to reevaluate a little bit who you were as an artist, where your music was coming from, who you were in your faith. Uh, and by the way, from from what I uh, my research has told and, and some of the people that we have on our staff, it was Pittsburgh State University. You actually uh, were classically trained, as you said, the trumpet. And uh, you got a music scholarship at Pittsburgh State University. and. Right. It it was at that point that you converted to Christianity. Tell tell me real quickly what that means to you because it, it when we talk about this, it's kinda like what you were alluding to, Jennifer, a moment ago about success. Success is relative because you know, for example, last night and I'm a musician myself as well as the host of the show, last night I went to a great uh, venue and it was an intentional living community here in Los Angeles and we there was you know, 15 artists. You know, none of us have come close to selling a million albums. None of us have got Grammy nods. But none of us, I think, feel that we were any less successful. And I love what you talked about in terms of that success definition, because success is relative. Tell me a little bit about, talk a little bit more about that success thing. But if you would, when, when, when we read about you converting to Christianity, let's talk about your faith, because your faith obviously has something to do with your music. It comes out. Um, can you address that a little bit? <laughs> well, you know, I, obviously, you know, I think in terms of the fact that I, I did, 
you know, in, in my time with the Christian music industry, I did three three records, about 30 songs, um, talking about, specifically about my experience with my faith. And, you know, the, the truth of the matter is, you know, I, 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 I chose Christianity very deliberately um, as an 18 or 19-year-old kid, and I think that was, you know, I think as an adult now, like, you know, well into my 30s, <laughs> I won't tell you yeah. how far, um, <laughs> But well into my 30s, you know, looking back on that, I, there there was something very legitimate about that dis, that decision and that choice that I made. But I didn't, you know, the, the euphoria of the moment, uh, I think, kind of took a long time for me to figure out what, not that I figured it out even, but to figure out at least a little bit of what the difference was between faith and belief. Um, I didn't really know what I believed at the time. I just knew that there, you know, I was having this radical experience because I'd heard the story of Christ, and it meant something to me. It it resonated in my heart, and I didn't really fully understand it, but I, I set about to write about this experience. And I put every ounce of my being into trying to figure out why this was such a radically life-changing encounter for me. I didn't really have a lot of concept of about organized religion. I didn't really have a sense of, you know, trying to accomplish what it was like to be a Christian. I just knew that there there was a story here, and now all of a sudden, I, in response to that, um, I was a Christian. And, I, you know, and so I was very happy to write about this, this experience for most of my life, and I think it still comes out. Um, in the music that I write today, even though I don't specifically write for a Christian audience. But I think my, my faith has radically changed my life in, in the ways that I, I no longer necessarily want to just serve myself. Um, I've definitely, you know, seen that for myself, I, I, I'm definitely a person of great value. And I'm a person of great worth. And in order to love my neighbor as myself, um, you know, I've I've kind of gone through a process of, of, of the, the Christianity. I'm not trying to make light of it. I just it's it's been such a radical experience in my life to be able to figure out how to kind of translate that out to the rest of the world. I think that shows up in my music and and my art from time to time. I think the the challenge for me was is this is kind of trying to superimpose life and living and the day to day things that kind of come up and the things that we write about or the things that we deal about. Um, kind of came, for me, kind of into a wall of the difference between faith and belief, trying to, you know, say that, listen, I had faith in this experience that I'd had that it was could radically transform my life, but not necessarily knowing how to believe. Um, it's, it's, it's a difficult kind of concept to kind of explain, but at the end of the day, I, I, I didn't really know if I was, you know, creating music like 10 years down the, the road. I didn't know if I was creating music because I was trying to kind of manufacture some kind of spiritual experience or if I'd actually had a spiritual experience that was coming out of my music. And that, that's kind of what led me to this point of just kind of like dropping it all and seeing, you know, which one came to the top. So I was quite surprised, you know, after a seven-year seven break, um, after kind of walking away from that whole thing, that, you know, one, I actually, you know, missed and cherished music and what it would allow me to express, and two, I was actually quite surprised that, that from time to time my spirituality actually showed up in that as well. But I didn't have to necessarily force those two in together, that they, they kind of lived and were part of my, my life and my experience. Jennifer, you did something which I I want to I want to talk about for a couple of minutes here, uh, if it's okay with you. Um, and I appreciate what you just talked about. You had your own spiritual and physical walkabout, for lack of a better term. You were at. <laughs> it's very good at, considering my considering my Australian citizen <laughs> citizenship. <laughs> okay, so you kind of had that moment where you were like, you know what, I'm I need to step back. And, and I know that you had uh, conflicting uh, messages coming at you um, based on interviews uh, that I've heard you done and, and, and have read about. Um, but you were at the height of your career, and you said, I'm going to walk away. I need to walk away, um, regardless of what that, the consequences potentially of that would be. I'm going to walk away. 
and you walked away at literally at the height of your career. Um, tell us a little bit about that. You know, I, I mean, at the time that I did it, I mean, it was just a self-preservation thing. I mean, I was exhausted. I didn't really know what I wanted to do anymore, and I, I, I kind of hated doing my job every day. I hated talking about my faith. I hated talking about music. I just didn't know. I just I was such an empty person and exhausted, exhausted, depleted at a certain point that I just I just said, listen, you can ask for more, but there's nothing left. So the kind of I felt like the only choice that I had was just to kind of stop. But I think since that time, one of the things that I recognize is that culturally, you know, as Americans, I think one of the things that we think about is that if we're being successful at something that we should do that thing, that successful thing, until it's completely depleted. Um, and, you know, we're kind of like, we're in the middle of, you know, is global warming a real thing, or natural resources finite, or, you know, that kind of green kind of talking. Right. But the truth of the matter is, you know, sometimes, I just think that sometimes we forget that culturally in the United States, is that, you know, it seems crazy to not make the maximum value and to take, from whatever's on offer until it's completely gone. And that that just seems strange. And, and for me, in terms of professionally, there wasn't any reason for me to discontinue what I was doing. I was, you know, still selling records successfully. I was still touring successfully. In fact, um, one of the things that most people don't know about is that I'd actually decided to quit doing music in a, a year before that I was actually contractually capable of doing so, which meant that I had had my, my life scheduled by contract for well a year in advance. That's how successful I was, was. I mean, I wasn't having a problem with knowing where my income was coming from. But on the other side of it, the, the challenge is, uh, you know, the challenge was that I didn't really, you know, here to me, I was participating in Christian music at least at some level because I had something to share. I had something about my experience that meant something to me. And yet here I was on a day-to-day -day basis not feeling like I could contribute to that conversation. Like I said, just I was completely depleted and I didn't really I didn't really care. It, and I, well, I I cared a lot. I think that's it's the wrong thing to say that I didn't care. I actually cared so much that it seemed incompatible for me to be continuing to perpetuate some kind of feeling and compassion for this, for continuing to talk about Christianity and encourage people to kind of look toward Christianity when I was really kind of just completely empty. I didn't care. I, I didn't know how to get up every day with the kind of energy that it took for me to actually respond to the people that I actually loved and cared about, to be able to talk about the faith experience that I had with compassion and at that point just say, not feeling like I had any compassion to be able to talk about it. So to me, it was, a, it was a very difficult decision. I mean, I've seen plenty of people. I've met plenty of people throughout their lives that have, have been in that same space and continued to choose the money over choosing, you know, you know, choosing the career at least and the security and knowing what's going to happen tomorrow and the day after that. But I just, I don't know. My conscience really wouldn't let me do it. And I found a difficulty, you know, I, I also found a difficulty in not knowing whether to stint, to, to distinguish whether or not I was participating in music because it was some kind of mandate from my faith or if I was, you know, only being a part of music, um, only being a part of Christianity because music had made that a successful venture for me. And I didn't know what the answer, I honestly at that point did not know what the answer was and I just, I didn't feel like it was appropriate for me to kind of continue that without being able to answer that successfully. So that was when I just kind of pulled the plug. And it seemed really radical and really crazy. I mean, I still had a record company that expected me to put out a couple of record, you know, a couple more records. There were radio people that were anticipating me doing more more radio, but I just said, no, I, I'm not going to do it anymore. And I, I literally quit. The, the day that I, the, I think it was September 2002, um, I played my last live gig, and I, I remember just looking down at my guitar case and putting my guitars in the case and walking away, and that was it. And I really thought that I'd quit doing music altogether. I, I didn't have any expectation of ever coming back. And yet you did come back, and you came back, Jennifer, with a 
bang, for lack of a better word, um, <laughs> and you you kind of you kind of uh, rocked the music industry, in particular the uh, Christian music industry, uh, with kind of an announcement. Um, what was that announcement? <laughs> Do you want to say it, or you want me to? You, uh, I'm happy to say it. Listen, yeah, in, in 2010, um, I actually returned with a new record, and you know, obviously, I have a, a huge legacy inside of the, the Christian music industry. In particular, um, there was a lot of um, excitement that I was coming back and releasing a new record, and and you know, for the the first kind of hesitant the first kind of hesitant announcement that I had was, the, listen, the music that I, w I have been writing and the current record that I have out um, called Letting Go, the Letting Go record wasn't a record that was specifically catered toward the Christian marketplace. But more interesting than that, as I opened myself up to the press, people were really starting to ask me about my sexual orientation. And so, you know, I, I was quite honest about my sexual orientation at that point. I'd been with my partner for for um, I think like eight years or something like that. So, um, I yeah, I can't re you know I, I can't remember how long it, at that point it was, but um, yeah. And so I, I led with the revelation that I was in a same-sex relationship, and that obviously just sh sent shockwaves through much of the Christian music community and um, most of the people who had worked with with me in the past. And it really kind of brought up a, a huge talking point as to whether or not, you know, a person of faith can be legitimately having a spiritual experience inside of Christianity while still claiming to be gay. Fair enough. And yet, uh, one of the things, and, and I, I noticed this, Jennifer, on an interview that I watched uh, recently uh, that you did with uh, Larry King uh, some time ago. And he kept referring to you as a Christian artist. And I could be wrong, and you'll tell me if I am, but you, the look on your face on that interview, you don't necessarily want to be identified as a contemporary Christian artist anymore. You're a woman of faith, obviously. And I want to talk a little bit about your faith. But what I noticed on that interview, and, and again, please, we're, we're having a conversation, we're being candid, but one of the things that I felt was that you kind of shied away from that particular. He asked you specifically, and I quote, he says, uh, do you consider yourself a Christian? And you talked about your faith. Um, and to me, it sounded, Jennifer, as if you were, you didn't, you, you don't necessarily want to be defined and you, as, as this or that. You know what your faith is. It comes through in your music. <laughs> Am I? Do you, do you see where I'm going here? Yeah. Well, I think there's there's a couple of different points to make. I mean, obviously, you know, there, there are a couple of different points to make. Is one the the Christian music marketplace, and to say that one is a Christian artist is very specific. You, in order to be able to act in that capacity, an artist typically has to be on a Christian record label has to have distribution to the Christian in marketplace, which is includes um, Christian retailers, bookstores, um, churches, and specialized shops that actually deal with Christian um, music. Um, you may get out into Targets and Walmarts and Best Buys and things like that, but generally to be able to be considered a Christian ar artist in that genre, you have kind of be, have to be functioning through that actual co the commercial mechanism. Um, I'm not doing that anymore. And I think secondly, and I think I would say secondly, that a majority of where artists like that perform are in churches. Um, to, one of the things I often describe is, is Christian music is by Christians for Christians um, from a Christian marketplace. And yes, I am a Christian, but I'm not on a Christian record label. I'm not through Christian distribution. And I'm, I'm the only, you know, and I'm not, having concerts, and I'm not trying to propagate Christianity um, specifically in the music that I create. That being said, it's very important, you know, and, and even between the time in the Larry King interview, I think that was early in 2010, and even now, I think the, the value of being able to speak the experience that I've had inside of my, my faith, which I would identify as traditionally Christianity, um, that's, that's my faith language. 
Um, but I think it's 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 an interesting thing that we've put on people to say, you know, this is what this is what I know a Christian is, and this is what I know a Christian does, and that there's a you know a set list of rules and box and fundamentals basically that allows one to be able to have their spiritual experience, and I think that's it's highly different and significantly different than having a profession where one works inside of that community and where one claims that as their faith. Um, so for me, yes, I mean, I would say at this point I'm very comfortable to claim my faith tradition as Christianity. I am continually inspired by Christ. It is through that kind of portal that I would describe my, my spiritual experience. However, I, I take very good care to talk about my faith because my faith is what allows me to feel like I'm having an experience with, with divine God and that I don't want to, um, my goal as a musician or as a public figure now is is different than what the goal is inside of Christian music industry, with the Christian music industry is specifically designed in a rather evangelical model. And, you know, the environments that I get to play in, the people that I get to meet, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not a fair trade-off to try and expect somebody to come into, you know, a lesbian bar on a Friday night and think that, you know, they have to be guilted into coming to church on a Sunday morning. They will tell you about their faith, and they will tell you about your experience. You just have to be there and be available. Um, trying to script that out for somebody in advance is not necessarily the point of interest for me. And that's that's kind no. of what limits me from ever being a participant in the Christian music industry again because, like I said, kind of one of the major models is that you have to kind of be there hoping to create overt and obvious music for a church or a faith environment where my, you know, where the music that I'm creating now has a, a lot more nebulous um, and vague kind of experience. Yet I think, you know, for those who do recognize the language, it definitely is there. Jennifer, you were you you you've been uh, and and uh, I don't mince words. Uh, you've been attacked uh, in a lot of different areas for your sexuality, for who you are. Uh, records were pulled off the shelves, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> and when I when I learned of that, one of the things that I thought was. And, and this is me being a human being. Uh, I was like, "What is that about?" And I looked at that, and then I, I and I and we've done our research, and and I've I've as you know I've followed your music for years, uh, and I was intrigued because you said in an interview uh, with uh, Christianity Today, I believe it was, you said, "I am who I am," and I don't want to market to an audience but I mark it to myself and my personal relationship with my faith and the people that I touch through my music. And that, I think, is really something that, uh, that, that I honor and that I think that musicians really need to go about. There's been so much focus in your career uh, in regard to the, uh, your sexuality. You know, every interview about this and that and the other thing. But... That's why we're really focusing tonight more on who's Jennifer? You know, where does her music come from, and how is she impacting, you know, the people around her, and how is her music impacting herself in that personal relationship with Christ? You went on in Larry King, uh, Larry King's interview, to say that music is about opening up doors to what you identify with, and that we should use it as a gift and grow from it. Um, but addressing that aspect alone, um, you're happier today than you were some years ago, I get the sense. Because I get the sense, and I could be incorrect, but I think it's coming through in your music. You are reflecting a real person. A real person of faith, a real person that's going through a journey, a real person that's saying, hey, this is who I am, and I don't need to defend it. Uh, this is what I stand for. This is what I support. And Christ welcomes all to his table. Uh, would that be an accurate statement? 
Yeah, I, you know, I think it's been an, a very interesting journey for me. And, I, I you know, I, one of the things I, I would say is that in the experience that I've, I've learned in, in having to write for a specific language, um, sometimes we tease inside of Christian communities that, that Christians speak Christianese. Um, it's a very specific language. You can identify Christians often if you're familiar with the language by the way that they speak without ever having said anything particularly religious, actually. Um, but in, in some of the ways that I had to write for, for Christianity specifically in writing my music, that I, I, was, you know, I was basically generally having to continually take a life experience and then plug it into an existing theology. Um, meaning that if I wrote a song about my life or whatever the song was that I wrote, that however it landed at the end, you know, when I, whenever I finished it, and I didn't really care about who I was writing it for. I was just telling the story of the experience. Oftentimes, in order to get that into the Christian marketplace, sometimes you have to kind of squeeze this through a hole that has to come out the other side looking like the cookie you expected it to look like. Um, it had to say the things about God that you expected to hear. It had to say the things about Jesus that you expected to hear. And it had to uphold, in some sense, a kind of theology that was in, in generally in, endorsed by that particular Christian music community. The problem with that is that life isn't necessarily always that neat. <laughs> is, you know, and, and I think in, in, the, in the terms of, like, sexual orientation kind of conflict that I end up being in, in the middle of conversation with quite often is that the question that arises is the theologies that we create or the theologies that we say that we have. Theology meaning the way that we think and the, the way that we as human beings believe God to be. When we describe about who we believe God to be, oftentimes we are taking the human experience in and putting, trying to reshape it rather than looking at the story that it is, the day that we found it, wanting to know what that story means, listening to the person that tells it, live, you know, watching and seeing that experience and grow, and then seeing where we found God inside of that story. What have we learned from God in, in seeing that person's life? What have we learned in her, hearing that experience? So it, it becomes an interesting kind of endeavor for me to kind of, you know, tell a story for me to be able to kind of tell a story with the hope of trying to convince someone of the theology I think that they should have. Um, instead, I would rather, you know, I found far more um, encouragement and, and peace and, and friendship and opportunity, I think, in, in telling the story that I've experienced, saying, listen, this is what I got from it. Maybe you've had a similar story. Maybe in my telling of my story, you can relate to it in some way and tell me another story. As a songwriter, that's particularly compelling to me because at the end of the day, each story is like you know a three and a half, four minute song. That you kind of, it's a moment in time. There's no way that you can capture the entire essence of who God is or what He does or unravel some mystery. It, it, at best, it continues to scratch away at the surface. So I think that's the opportunity that I, I really love and I enjoy about not necessarily writing specifically for a Christian marketplace. Is saying, listen, this is the story as I found it. And you know, in terms of the folks that I know that share my same language in terms of faith, it's quite an amazing opportunity because if you just tell the story without having to determine what the answer is at the end of it, I think it gives us an opportunity to see some amazing and surprising mysteries kind of unfold without even expecting to know what we are going to see. I got that. I got that. I appreciate that. So there's people that would say that, uh, I don't know, I guess you might consider it the conservative Christians um, and uh, we don't hold any uh, uh, anything back here on this show. The reality is, is that as you as you may or may not know, you know, Universal Life or Reverb Radio, we broadcast uh, around the world. We talk about musicians that are making an impact. We're hosted through Blog Talk Radio. Um, we're also an extension of the ULC World Headquarters out of Carabel, Florida, which is a Christian faith-based ministry out of Carabel, Florida, and. When I can, I can tell you this. When I, 
told people that uh, you were coming on the air, I actually got a few emails uh, that disturbed me. <laughs> Quite frankly, <laughs> they, they irritated me. They were like, wait, you can't have Jennifer Knapp come on the air because of this and that and this and that. And, and we've talked about that a little bit. And, and my response to them was, you know what, um, then don't listen. You know, the reality is, is that, that, that I, I believe personally that uh, Christ shows up in so many different ways uh, to us. And the conservative Christians, and, and I might get in trouble for, for saying this on the air live, but I'm going to say it, I don't care. <laughs> the conservative Christians very often, uh, and you've addressed this in the past, we, and Christ warned about this, uh, using our faith as a way of pointing fingers at people and saying, this is the way that you should be. Not that there's not moral tenets, but more so going, this is my interpretation of the moral tenets, and I'm right and you're wrong. And I think that one of the things is that, uh, go ahead, go ahead. Well, here's the thing I would say is that, it's especially in a, inside of a Christian community, I would say this, is that one, like think about as an individual today, right now, sitting there, think about your encounter as a, a human being when you say, I am a Christian. And you think about what led you to that point as an individual, that moment in time in your life where you, when you said that this was something that you're going to respond to. And maybe that was, you know, a year ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. The longer that that gets, I would say the more realistic. You've probably even said that this is a potent and real experience that I've had in my life. So for you to be able to say that, and, and I would say that as an individual, saying, listen, I had this encounter. I saw the story. I heard the story of Christ. I saw the story of Christ. And, and in all of its mystery, it's radically changed my worldview. It's radically made me, you know, it's literally saved my life, and I wouldn't exchange that for anything in the world. So as, as those of us who understand that strange and that complex language that I just used, what right. on earth, what on earth could we do that says would separate somebody from that experience? If you've had an experience with your faith, that is legitimate, mysterious though it may be, and long-lasting, who among any of us has the right to say that that person's experience wasn't legitimate, didn't have the right to be able to continue to profoundly impact their lives for you know, the rest of their lives. And that's, that's where I begin to say, listen, I understand that some of us have theological differences on how we view LGBTs or lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgendered people. However, sexual orientation is not the measuring stick that we begin to have in the discussion about what faith experiences have actually impacted people's lives. It has nothing what would, to do with what, it. What would be the measuring stick, Jennifer? Well, the measuring stick is somebody being able to account, to me, somebody being able to account their experience with being able to see or desiring to see the divine, to be able to see God, to be able to understand God in his or her tradition of faith that they've been brought up with. That may be Southern Baptist, that may be Nazarene, Lutheran, Methodist. I could go on. In the Christian denomination alone, there are over 34,000 different flavors of which we divide ourselves up in theological differences. But at the center of that, at the very center of that, is a faith experience that's legitimate for the person who's received it. And I, you know, I think it's very difficult for one theology, 34,000 different denominations removed, to be able to judge from that distance away about the legitimacy of that person's faith experience. So my argument oftentimes inside, inside of the faith communities, and particularly inside of Christianity, is that while we think that we're holding up a particular standard of what a Christian is, does, and looks like, 
we have no idea really what that is. And until we can absolutely 100% show and give a perfect example of what that experience is, outside of the very simple thing, which means if somebody has a faith and has responded and has seen Christ in a particular way, then we, you know, we need to afford a wide path for people to be able to find their spiritual lives and their spiritual t traditions. And that includes people of all sexual orientation. That includes, to me, that includes people of all denominations. It, it's it's a very radical. I mean, here I'll add one other thing. There's there's nothing more offensive, I think, that you can say to another human being on the planet, even to an atheist or somebody who doesn't believe in God. The the even when you tell an atheist that God doesn't love you and that God has no future plan or hope for you or cannot be concerned with you, and that's one of the things that we do inside of our, our Christian community at, at most. Christians say to other Christians, you don't belong here. That one of the worst things that we can do is tell somebody, like, the creator of the universe doesn't even value you. Mm. When what's made very clear to us, especially to people who are Christian, is that at the very least, we should be the individual where that's the only thing that should concern us, is loving our neighbor as ourselves, Loving the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and loving your neighbor as yourself. And I'm going to revisit that. Let me, let me just uh, throw this out there. We are talking to Jennifer Knapp uh, here on Universal Life Reverb Radio. We're here every Saturday evening from 7 p.m. here on the Pacific Coast in California, 10 p.m. on the Eastern Seaboard, which has become one of my favorite words. And uh, we, we were scheduled to have a number of other artists come on. And we're going to highlight them. We're going to play a little bit of their songs here later on in the broadcast and in the subsequent weeks, including Zarina Lupo from uh, New York, who is a 13-year-old singer-songwriter who uh, is an amazing young lady, as well as uh, Nikki Kelly here in Los Angeles, and uh, Carly Jo Jackson. Uh, who's got a great message, and it's an anti-bullying uh, message uh, in one of her songs. And uh, But we're going to continue to talk to Jennifer uh, here on Universal Life Reverb Radio. We're broadcast again every Saturday evening, 7 p.m. But we're not going to stop this conversation uh, because it's it's a good one, and uh, we appreciate uh, the other artists for who are interested to call in. But uh, we're going to continue moving forward here because this is what we do. <laughs> and uh, I might get some emails a little bit later on. But we just want to, you know what, the show is about, guys, listeners, callers, all of you that have attempted to call in, all of you that have been lined up to be on the show tonight, understand something. Uh, I'm a little bit untraditional. And I definitely um, appreciate everyone that's calling in and, uh, is, and we want to have uh, – everyone have an opportunity to spotlight. But every once in a while, the Spirit just kind of moves you and takes you to a direction. And uh, we just want to make sure that we follow that. I want to make sure that we follow that. We're talking to Jennifer Knapp. We're talking about music. We're talking about uh, a little bit of her history and where she's come from. We've, we're, we're talking about some controversial stuff here on Universal Life Reverb. That's what we do. That's what I do. I'm going to continue to do it until I'm shut down, which is <laughs> probably not going to happen. But if it does, uh, blessings on that one. But uh, I just wanted to throw a, uh, a note out there that we have not forgotten about Serena and uh, Nikki Kelly and Carly Jo Jackson. Let me just uh, say this. Uh, you can go to ReverbNation.com, by the way, and you can get more information about these other artists, Zarina Lupo, uh, from New York, Carly Jo Jackson out of Tennessee, and uh, Nikki Kelly from right here uh, in the City of Angels, Los Angeles. But right now, we're going to continue forward with the conversation with Jennifer Knapp, and we appreciate, uh, again, Jennifer, you coming on the air. Uh, let me ask you a question. Uh, hey, yeah, no worries. And, hey, let me let me just warn you, I've got to, I got to, enough time for about one more question otherwise i'm going to have to i'm going to have to roll here in a minute um okay, but I'll, i can do one i can do one more question for you mate okay well here's the question i have for you you've got a uh tell us a little bit about um the upcoming uh inside out tour and uh, where people can find more information about you and your music 
and uh, uh, tell us about what you've got coming up here. Well, Inside Out Faith, um, let, me, let me first give the, the website address for that. That's Inside Out, O-U-T, Faith, F-I-T-H, dot org. Um, basically, that is a nonprofit I'm starting up that specifically deals with LGBT advocacy, advocacy inside of faith communities. So generally what we're talking about is, is being able to, to sh do the, share, the storytelling portion of what I've experienced in the last couple of years, which is that a lot of faith communities seem to think that their faith community is incompatible with allowing LGBTs to be able to participate, to be able to be fully functioning spiritual human beings in, inside of those communities. When one of the things that we find out is that oftentimes when people come out, one of the first things that they lose is their family and their, their church and their friends um, and their communities based on religious biases or prejudices or um, some kind of idea that in, in some essence that their faith and their spirituality has simply left them because they've come out. Um, this is clearly not the case. Um, one of the one of the reasons why we know this is that you know twenty you know more than twenty or thirty years of people being out, being you know in in long term relationships, being uh, incredible members of their community and their faith communities as well. Um, th these things don't disappear the moment someone realizes their sexual orientation isn't heterosexual. So part of Inside Out Faith is being able to go to other church communities that are interested in being able to have this dialogue to be able to talk about this and story tell. I, I tell my story. The idea with um, turning Inside Out Faith into a foundation is not only will I be the one going around and telling my story in faith communities across the country, but other people who have similar stories that um, can contribute to this conversation will be doing that as well. Um, and as well, and the other kind of point to make is that inside faith communities, oftentimes there are people who want to be able to support their local, you know, somebody inside of their church or their congregation who happens to be gay. They've brought their kids there and their family there, and all of a sudden, you know, what everybody wants to do is kick them out. It, maybe it's a community that wants to actually kick them out and not support them in a time of need. And if a pastor occasionally stands up and does this, the odds you know, the, occasionally a pastor will lose their job by being advocating for um, LGBT people of faith. So one of the ways that the church community can punish people is by uh, eliminating their possibility for employment, stripping income, stripping ordination, um, um, giving the pastor no opportunity to uh, lead and pastor and serve a community anymore. So one of the ways that we hope is to be able to provide emergent funds for those people who have stood up on occasion to love their neighbor as, as their self and to create a spiritually safe place for them and as a result are, da you know, are financially damaged in, in standing up and being affirmative and open for those LGBTs inside of their faith communities. Jennifer, I know that you have to go, and I just wanted to let you know that it's been a blessing to me and I'm sure to our listeners to have you on. Thank you for extending your time. Uh, we're going to be following you. Guys, you can get more information about Jennifer and her upcoming uh, uh, tour and what she's all about uh, by visiting www.jennifernapp.com. Thanks so much, Jennifer, for joining us. I appreciate your time tonight. God bless. You too. God bless you. Can't squeeze blood from a turnip I hold my breath blue I've waited and waited and waited on you You do what you want, I do what I can I'm trying to keep faith in mind
Trying to keep faith in your fellow 